Welcome to the Catholic Retrospective Podcast. This is Father Peter Mangum. We left the last episode having answered the simple question, did Martin Luther intend to start a new church? To which we indicated clearly that that was not his intention behind the 95 Theses at all. We continued to fervently pray for Christian unity, using each episode as an occasion to introduce some extraordinarily beautiful prayers straight from the Roman Missal for Masses dedicated to Christian unity. Now on to Episode 5, Catholic Europe and the Response to Luther. As a follow-up to last week's podcast on Martin Luther, the sparking of the Protestant movement, and the historical fact of the splintering in Christianity that resulted— I wish for us to explore the historical context for the beginning of the Catholic response to these events. As we've noted before, the consequences of the events of 1517 continued to be felt and seen today in the many divisions that separate Christians. A review of history shows that, indeed, it was the threat of division that prompted the Church as well as many secular rulers, to respond immediately and most urgently to those who protested. It's good to remember here that, as the theme of this series has suggested, the Church transcends the very history we are now exploring. Because of that, we begin to see how we can simultaneously take responsibility for wrongful actions of the Church and regret the separation of Protestants. In its earthly existence, the church was in need of reform and would, in fact, ultimately find the renewal and reform from within. This is why, for us, the Protestant Reformation is not a historic event to celebrate, but also, as I said earlier, with great hope and prayer for the full restoration of our previous unity. At the time the Protestant movement began in 1517, the Pope was Leo X. His initial response to Martin Luther was one of cautious waiting, although certainly the Pope would have been aware of the complaints Luther raised. Within the next three decades, a great Catholic Reformation acted to address and correct the very abuses of practice that Luther highlighted. But in the interim, the Church witnessed the unfortunate splintering of the faithful into many different groups. Pope Leo X is even quoted to have said of Luther, What fatherly charity have we omitted that might call him back from such errors? Soon enough, Martin Luther's protests moved beyond some of the corrupt practices of the church and began to criticize historic doctrines and the nature of the authority, as we talked about briefly last week. Others in Europe followed suit, and the Protestant movement began to split as opinions about doctrinal meanings differed. Luther's followers, of course, became the Lutheran Church. Many of Zwingli's followers became a sect known as the Anabaptists, practicing adult baptism and having no sacramental understanding of the Eucharist. John Calvin's theology found expression in the Presbyterian Church. A political movement in 16th century England produced what would become Anglicanism and later the Methodists. And that's just the beginning. From those original branches came many, many more groups as well. Sadly, Protestantism was a movement that, from its beginning, was defined by division and disagreement. Once the test for true doctrine began to be one of man's interpretation and not the teaching authority of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, more and more separation occurred. The earliest hint of disunity is what prompted Pope Leo X to issue the papal bull Exorge Domine in 1520. This document threatened excommunication for Martin Luther if he did not recant his writings and repent for sowing seeds of division by departing from the teachings of the faith. In a rather infamous act of defiance, Luther burned this papal bull publicly in his home city of Wittenberg. In the following year of 1521, Pope Leo X issued a second papal bull, Decet Romanum Pontificem, 
this time declaring that Martin Luther had indeed taken himself out of the communion of the church. Just a few months later, Holy Roman Emperor Charles V asked Luther again to recant, but again Luther refused. As a result, he was outlawed in the Holy Roman Empire. But many of the newly Protestant German nobles protected him, and the Protestant movement continued to spread. These events have been noted by many to represent a major shift in the course of Western civilization. As a result of the Protestant movement, Western thought moved rapidly towards embracing individualism and later moral relativism. Some might see progress in such an intellectual shift. For the Catholic Church, however, these events represent a tear in the body of Christ. No, we do not celebrate. We grieve and we long for communion. Once the Protestant movement was underway, the church responded by looking inwardly with its own kind of historic retrospective and undertook the cause for true reform. This began in earnest at the three sessions of the Council of Trent, something we will explore in a later podcast. Up next, however, is an examination of some of the ideas that came forth from Protestantism, what we as Catholics might be able to learn from them, yes, you heard that right, and what we as Catholics know to be error and why. But now we pray, again using another beautiful text, our fifth episode, our fifth different prayer. This one is a second collect. The church recommends we pray in the second of its collection of masses for Christian unity. So let us pray. Make known in us, O Lord, the abundance of your mercy, and in the power of your Spirit, remove the divisions between Christians, that your church may appear more clearly as a sign raised high among the nations, and that the world, enlightened by your Spirit, may believe in the Christ whom you have sent, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Until next week, this is Father Peter Mangum. Thanks for listening to the Catholic Retrospective Podcast. <laughs>